everybody up. I set my timer for 35 minutes. Not going to happen. It's a long message. But uh, you guys can handle it, right? All right. You guys ate breakfast and had coffee, right? How many people in here eat breakfast every day? Oh, come on. You guys know breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Come on. You can't be like kids. You've got to be like grown-ups, right? Like adults. Wake up and eat some food. I can't. I sleep too long. Be a grown-up. Go to bed a little earlier. Why is it so quiet in here? I remember when I was just, just turned 18, got a great job, and I moved out and got my first apartment. It was a scary apartment, but it was mine. And I got it, and I was like, no one is going to tell me nothing. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to come home when I want. I'm going to, man, I, I'm free now. So I went, had my apartment, had my job, had my new car, start partying every night. But my job, I had to be up at 3.30 in the morning to be at work by 5 because it was about 45 minutes away, drive. And so I was just hitting it hard. And then after a week, I was so exhausted. I got home from work one afternoon, and I, I would get home like in the middle afternoon so I got home from work and I laid down on the floor to take a little nap and my alarm woke me up for work the next morning. I literally slept from the afternoon all the way to the next morning. And I woke up and I thought, man, that's it. I'm too tired. I can't do that. From now on, I have to have at least five hours of sleep. I'm going to be at home by this time every night. And I was like, did I just give myself a curfew? Did I just give myself a curfew? that's earlier than the one my parents had for me when I lived there that I complained about? How many people know that's just real life? At some point, you gotta grow up. Somebody say grow up. Grow up. Somebody tell the person next to you, grow up. Especially if you, don't, if you don't know them, it makes it more fun. If it's your spouse, be careful. Well, that's not the title of the message, but it's my title of the message. The, the message from the discipleship book um, I'm actually supposed to be preaching on the disciples' love this morning, but uh, I, I don't feel like that. So I'm preaching on the disciples' maturity, the disciples' maturity. Hebrews 6.1, Paul says, let us go on to maturity. And so this is my title of the message that you can add next to that, grow up. Say grow up. Grow up. How many people know you're talking to yourself now? Yeah. Come on, let's pray. We're going to get into it. Listen, you gotta, today you've got to be disciplined. There's kind of a lot of information but it's very practical and it'll help you, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for worship. Thank you that we could be here together lifting up the name of Jesus, that, that we're free, that we're born again, that, that you have blessed us and, and that your hand is on our lives. And Lord, we love you. We, we love to be in your presence. And, and so as we receive your word this morning, Lord, just anoint it with your spirit. Let us receive it and get it in our hearts and in our minds that we could change, Lord, so that we could be better for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, God's revealed purpose is to produce disciples who will reflect, check this out, the perfect humanity of his son in their life and in their Christian service. Let me, let me tell you what that means. So we see Jesus, and, and a lot of times people see Jesus, they make the mistake of, of thinking they see the spiritual side of Jesus but they, they try to ignore the human side of Jesus, okay? Now, Jesus is both God and man, 100%. Not 50-50. He's 100% God at all times. But he's 100% man. He, he was born and lived on, on the earth, right? Now, check this out. Jesus is not, man, you got to get this. Jesus is not a God to be admired, He's a man for us to follow and copy. He, he's not there just to be our hero. He's our hero, but he's our example. We are commanded and can live the way that Jesus lived. And sometimes we look and we say, oh, well, he's God. And we remove ourselves from the responsibility of being Christ-like. So we put Christ-like in the spiritual realm, and then we don't apply it to our natural life. Does that make sense? Then you're in danger because you can become extremely religious and never grow up in the faith. 
the worst thing is people who are so educated in the Bible and in church and go around talking stuff that does not show up in their busted down life. I'm not talking about a new Christian. Nobody gets mad at a baby for being a baby. Babies are babies, right? But when you're five and you're still acting like a baby, how many people hate when your kids, if you have kids and when my kids were five and they go, daddy, I want, I'll be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I can't even hear baby talk. When you're a baby, it's cute. When you're five, that's not cute. Talk with the weird voice that five-year-olds have. Don't try to talk with a two-year-old voice. You know what I'm talking about? They do that. They think it's cute because they see people, they're like, oh, we like that. It's cute. When you get older, it's not cute. You know, when, you, when you're a little kid and you say funny things when you're three, those things aren't funny when you're 17. And when you're 35, they're downright ridiculous and stupid. But there's people that live like that in their, in their personal life because they don't think that that is spiritual. Spiritual things are, are spiritual. My personal life doesn't really matter. So the fact that I can't keep a freaking job doesn't matter because I'm so spiritual and I have Facebook. And I put cool, cool quotes on there. But I'm going to tell you right now, your spirituality is absolutely shown, your maturity is shown in how you live your life, in how you work at your job, in how you behave. You know, we were at the encounter one time in this Marine, I think Brian was there, and this Marine was giving his testimony, and he had this radical encounter. God did incredible things in his life, and he got up there, and he was like, man, Jesus changed my effing life, and he said it. And he was crying. And we were all just sitting there. And some people were in shock. And I remember telling the guys afterwards, I said, the guy's been saved two days. It's not that we think that that's okay. But check this out. But we understand. He's just communicating how he knows how about the incredible experience that he just had. That's how he knows how to communicate. Give him a minute. Right? Like, it wouldn't be right for us to jump on him and say, hey, let us check. That, that's the least of this dude's problems. And if you heard his testimony, it was powerful. It's like, just give him some time. Now, when he's been serving God for six months and he's doing that, how many people know we don't understand? It's not acceptable. It's easy to look at something like cussing, but then we don't want to apply it to things in our life like being on time. Because cussing's bad, but being late, that's okay. Because I'm spiritual. I'm by the Holy Ghost. How many people are glad that the Holy Ghost is always right on time? The more you get filled with the Holy Ghost, maybe the more disciplined we would be. How many people like the title of the message now, Grow Up? You're like, man, I'm, somebody needs to hear this. Yeah, you're somebody. And just so you know. This message brutalized me as I was studying for it, so it's not fun for me either, but too bad we're getting it. Thanks for that laugh from back in the peanut gallery. <laughs> One of the frustrating things, though, is it's easy to get discouraged with how slow we're growing, right? Um, did anybody ever do that thing at your house where they put the tape on the wall that has the ruler on it, and you stand up when you're a little kid, and your parents, you know, they make a little line to see how tall you are? And you back up and you look at it. It's like the coolest thing, right? So what do you do the next day when you're a little kid? Let's do it again. Like, uh, it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> and then you go over there and you do it again and it's just a darker line. Well, at my house, that was a really discouraging thing because mine wasn't moving. You know what I'm saying? But you forget about it and then you go back six months later and you do it and you're like, oh, I grew. I didn't notice it. But when you look back, you can see that you grew. Maybe not as much as you wanted to, but you, it's like that with your, your spiritual maturity too. If you try to measure it every day, you're just going to be disappointed. But if you look back over six months, you can say, well, this is how I thought, and this is how I think now. These are some things that, that I did wrong, that I, those things aren't in my life anymore. I'm learning some things. I'm growing, right? But then comes the part where, I'm a little discouraged, though, because I thought I'd be a little farther along than this. Was anybody here this morning? How many people in here think, man, I, I probably should be a little farther along than I am right now? 
Is that anybody or just me? Anybody ever have anything in your life and you think, am I really still dealing with that? Because that's like being 35 dealing with three-year-old problems. There's no way that should be in my life. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The maturity that Jesus has in view is not confined to the spiritual life, but it has to be lived out in our body, in our life. Bishop Westcott in his commentary on Hebrews on the same verse, and he says, and when Paul says, let us go on to maturity, he says there's three translations that you, are three translations of, of how that verse can be understood. And he said, all of them have a warning. Listen to what they are. The first one is this. We may stop too soon. We, you might stop. You're growing, but then you might stop. When you first get saved, you realize, man, I need to grow. I, I don't know anything. I, I need to grow, right? And so you have this desire to grow. But a lot of people think they got there. They think they're the stuff. They get prideful. They think, and it's funny because Paul is pretty much agreed upon that he's the most sanctified person that lived, if not the most, one of the most, right? And Paul says, I have not yet attained. Now, if he says that, no matter how awesome you think you are, you might want to take that verse and put it in your life. Because we're never going to get there. We're required to keep growing. Yeah. Amen? Another thing is you might quit because you get discouraged. You might quit because you get discouraged. Um, John Mark, when he was traveling with Paul, he quit and went home. He got discouraged. Some people get discouraged and they think, it's no sense. I messed up too many times. I'm just not even going to do it anymore. You know what? Don't quit. Don't give up. You're definitely not going to grow and be who God's called you to be if you quit. If you get discouraged, just drag your discouraged butt in here on Sunday. Worship Jesus. Tell him you're sorry. Tell him, I know you know how dumb I am. I also know. <laughs> I know you've known for a long time. I figured it out this week. Thanks for letting me come. Isn't that a better attitude about being in church? It's like, man, thanks for letting me be a part of the kingdom. Man, you're good to me. If, if you get discouraged, you feel like quitting, don't quit. Just get back in there and tell the Lord where you're at. And the third thing is this, is that people feel like they have to do it on their own. It's too hard. I can't do it on my own. You don't have to do it on your own because we've received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us and he wants to help you. Now watch this. When we pray and we ask God something, right? We're praying and we're, we're giving him a petition. Here, how many people want to know a secret to receiving what you pray for? You want to know? Okay, five of you, everybody else, I'll tell you anyway. All you have to do is pray something that you know is God's will for your life. Guaranteed to get an answer to prayer. You don't have to do it by yourself. All you have to do is pray and say, Lord, I need to mature. I, I need to grow up in the faith. The Lord's not going to go, no, ask me three more times. How many people know he wants to answer that prayer? You are, you are praying something that we know is his will for your life. Amen? So you don't have to do it by yourself. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And you're not going to become mature overnight. You know, it's funny when you're younger, you wish your whole life away. It's the weirdest thing. When you're little, you're like, I can't wait to go to school. As soon as you start going to school, you're like, man, I hate school. Can't wait for summer. So you're waiting for summer. Summer comes, you're like, man, this is boring. I can't wait to go to school. Can't wait to get in junior high. Can't wait to get to high school. I hate high school. I can't wait to get out of high school. I'm going to go to college. I hate college. Can't wait to graduate. Man, I wish I was 16 so I could drive. Man, I wish I was 21 so I can get a discount on my insurance. That's not until 25. And then you spend the rest of your life going, man, I don't want to be 30. Man, I don't want to be 40. Man, I don't want to be 50. You know what I tell people? It beats the alternative. You could be dead. You don't have to, you don't have to get old. You could die, right? We don't want to do that, so let's get old. But it's funny. We wish our whole life away hoping for this, this next thing. And that's craziness. What we need to do is be in the moment, be committed to the moment, and understand that the next season is going to be better if we get on it in this season. Yeah. We have too many fast food drive through restaurants. You ever, you ever go to like a drive through and they take like five minutes and you're in your car going, come on. 
How long does it take? You know, that's how we get with our spiritual life. It's like, I already prayed twice. Where are you at, Jesus? It's like, well, your last season kind of sucked. So we're going to work that out in this season. And then you're going to pray and change in this season. You're going to have a better season next season. How many people know that's not drive through that, that's, that's some good old-fashioned home cooking. I cooked some ribs the other day for my first time. And I couldn't believe that I literally had to put them in the oven three and a half hours. I was like, three and a half hours of smelling that? In my, I'm hungry now. How many people know you got to make some food and eat? Because that's not happening for a long time. And then Luke and I made some stuff in the pressure cooker. Ten hours. Like ten hours. We're going to eat like nine times. Before that's done, hey, some things take some time. Come on. You want to grow? It takes time, right? All right, so I'm going to give you four things. I was going to say quick. That would be a lie. I'm going to try to not lie in this message. Number one, recognize things that help you mature. Recognize things that help you mature. Say recognize. The aspiring disciple should, like a student, be prepared to work through his courses because there's no such thing as instant maturity, right? So... If you go to, how many people go to the gym? How many people have been to the gym? How many people have driven by a gym? How many people have a vague idea of what happens in a gym? Well, you can go in the gym, and and I was in there with my son, Luke. We were there doing our thing. And uh, the gym can, the gym's funny. Going to the gym does not get you in shape. There's two different types of people up in the gym. Going there doesn't make you healthy. Man, you got to get this. You're going to get out of it what you put into it. It's available. And I would tell my son, you see that guy? He's not doing jack. He's sitting on his phone getting fatter. You see that guy over there? He has headphones on. He's not talking to anybody He's trying to lift all the weights at one time in the whole gym. You see how much he's sweating? You see how much he's not sweating? How many people know what I'm talking about? You can't say, well, I went to church and it didn't work. It's not that it doesn't work. It's that you don't work. You can't go to a music class and get mad because you can't play the guitar. It's not what happens at the class. That's where you learn. Then you got to go put it into practice. That's what spiritual life is. You can't go to a class and then not learn and get mad at the teacher. You're a terrible teacher. I'm a great teacher. You're the suckiest student that ever lived. Man, I went to that church and I wasn't getting fed. Get up and feed your freaking self. What is your problem, man? Are you still three? Man, I'm just not getting enough meat. Well, get your Bible out and get your study on. No, do it for me. Oh, man, if this is a men's meeting, I would say something so awesome. (laughs) Talking about motherhood and babies and giving them the nurturing that they need. And you ain't getting that from me. Try to nuzzle up in my bosom. (laughs) Try to get up on my paps. That's King James Version. You could get an elbow in your eye. I had a rule with my kids. You know, they were breastfeeding, doing their things. Like, all right. Two things. When you got teeth, you're getting something else. When you're old enough to ask for it, you're old enough to get something else. How many people know what I'm talking about? So as a Christian, are you here? Well, you're not doing it for me. What are you doing? You, you need it. These things right here, they're awesome if you take them and do them. If you just hear this and go get lunch and forget it and wait to be spiritual next week, don't come crying to me that your life isn't working. You're not working. You you reap what you sow. What you put into it, you get out of it. You you go to the gym, what you put into it, you get out of it. Right? What you put into your spiritual life, you'll get out of it. You go to school, you'll get out of it what you put into it. Right? Right. How many people know that we need to grow up? Some people think that that just hanging around is going to mature you. But I know a lot of old foolish people. How embarrassing to be an old fool. How embarrassing to be an old man or an old woman 
sitting around talking the same stupid stuff that you talked. Nothing going on in your life. Just being an old fool. I don't know about you, but that, that's scary to me. I don't want to live like that. Come on, you want to be old and have people think, hey, I want to hear what you have to say because you've done some things in your life. Right? You need self-discipline. And, another bad word, perseverance. Perseverance means don't give up. Self-discipline, the key word there, is self. Life will discipline you. Life is a merciless teacher. If you're stupid, life will teach you the same lesson every single day without mercy with no problem at all. You can cry all you want and life will be, I'll be waiting for you tomorrow, stupid. No problem at all. Kind of like when I got my apartment. I was like, I'm going to go party and nobody's going to stop me. A week later, I was like, and I am taking myself to bed at 1030. Self-discipline. Because I was smart enough to realize that I got that job because of my dad and I didn't have an education and there's no way I was going to get a job like that and I don't want to mess it up and I wanted some money. How many people know that's the beginning of all wisdom? I need to get my butt in bed and go to work. If some people in here would get that right now, you would be miles ahead in growing up. I remember, I, I know this guy, I met him when I was a new Christian, 23 years old. And the first year that I was saved, I read the Bible twice. Well, actually, I read the Bible once before I got saved and then halfway through and then I got saved and then I read it again. So I had read it about two and a half times. Met this guy. His name is Arlie Christ. I'm sure he's in heaven now. He was 72 or 73 at the time. He was one of the guys that, that um, stormed the beach in Normandy during the war and crazy, right? And he had this huge belly, like this big, and it was round like just round, and when he hugged you, he would pull you over the belly, and it was like a rock, you know, but he always talked about love, and he knew the Bible like crazy, and, and I really liked this guy, and I was like, man, I want to hang out with this guy. He was a winter visitor in Yuma, so I would go to the trailer park where he had his little RV set up, you know, we, <laughs> we'd sit outside and talk, and one day I asked him, I said, Arlie, I said, how many times have you read the Bible? He said, 25 times, and I was like, What? I had never even heard of anyone reading the Bible 25 times in my life. How many people in here, you have read the Bible one time completely from uh, table of contents to maps? Anybody you read the whole Bible? Two times, five times, 10 times. It's a lot, right? Now check this out. This guy told me 25 times and I thought, what? And then I asked him this great question. How did you do that? Isn't that a great question? Not, man, I can never do that. Well, I don't know how to do that. How did you do that? And he told me, well, it's easy. I wake up in the morning. I read, uh, I think he said five chapters in the Old Testament in the morning and three chapters in the New Testament every day. And then you read through the whole Bible in a year. And he said, and sometimes I do some other reading and stuff and devotional time and some study, but... But I do that every day. I just wake up in the morning, read some chapters, and then after lunch, I read some chapters in the New Testament. And in a year, I did it. And he says, 25 years, I've been doing that, and I read the Bible 25 times. That's spiritual maturity. Does that, does that make sense? It can't happen now. You, you might think, I wish I would have read the Bible. Well, you're not going to read it today, but you can start today. And in a short amount of time, you'll realize, hey, I'm reading the Bible. After a year, when people say, have you even read the whole Bible? You can say, yeah, I did. And now, in my life, you're talking, I got saved when I was 23. I'm 48. That's 25 years. Guys, I, I, and I'm not bragging. I literally am amazed looking back. I've read the Bible, the, the whole thing, front to back, besides studying, at least 30 times. It's unbelievable to hear me say that. You have to listen to what I'm telling you. Because I'm telling you the story of when I was 23, and I couldn't believe that somebody had read the Bible that many times. It blew my mind. But I started doing that. Now, this many years, I look back, and I'm amazed. Guys, that's the grace of God that empowers you to mature if you'll make self-discipline a part of your life and start to do a little bit now. You'll grow and grow, and when you look back over time, you'll even be amazed at what God did in your life. Does that make sense? If we're going to grow in Christ, the first question that we have to ask is this, is, is Jesus Lord? And the way that we know that is by asking who makes the decisions in my life. People are like, 
going to get this job. I'm going to move to this city. I'm going to marry that person. I'm going to buy that car. I'm going to do this. Never ask Jesus. I'm going to get this $800,000 loan just because I'm going to do this and I'm going to buy that business. Or I'm... Never even consult the Lord. Jesus is not Lord. He has to be involved in your life. He has to be the Lord of your life. He has to be the one who makes the decisions. Does that make sense? Sometimes he's not going to speak to you clearly, and sometimes you're going to have to step out in faith and do the best you can. But sometimes we don't ask and we do what we want. Are you here? I've had people come and tell me, the Lord told me that I'm supposed to do this. And I'm like, all right, because I never argue with what people think God told them. Notice I said think. If that's what you say, right on. The same people a week later, you know what? Actually, the Lord's telling me that I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to do this. And then I always say the same thing. It's crazy that the Lord is just as emotional as you and can't figure out what you're supposed to do with your life either. It seems that you and Jesus are both double-minded and unstable in all of your ways. Wait, that's you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're a spiritual schizophrenic. You're not listening to God. You're emotional. You're an emotional car accident waiting to happen. So next time you want to tell me what Jesus told you, you might want to evaluate it with the word and factor in your emotions. I remember I was looking at a building as a youth pastor, and my senior pastor said, so what's the Lord telling you about this building? Should we get it or not? And I looked at him, I said, I can't hear Jesus right now. And he said, why? And I said, I'm so excited and I want this building so much. I can't hear anything he's saying because my soul is screaming. It's like, get it, get it. So don't ask me, I'm the wrong guy. How many people know that's a good thing? Recognize when you're emotional about something and you're not hearing from God. Man, I'm super excited. I probably need to pray about this, but I'm not even good at praying about it right now because I really want it or I really don't want to do it or I don't like it. But we have to factor that in so that we can hear the Lord. Then we can pray and say, Lord, show me what you want me to do. Yeah. Number two. This is a great one. Look at that. Accept external disciplines. We all like to be self-disciplined, or we like to pretend to be, or we appreciate that, but we hate external discipline, right? Don't you hate when somebody makes you do something that you know you should do, that you don't want to do? How many people know that you shouldn't speed? How many people know I'm not pretending that I don't speed, because I do <laughs> regularly, but I have a very, very expensive high-tech radar detector. It's hooked up to satellites and updates me on speed traps and everything. But you shouldn't speed. How many people know when you see those red and blue lights behind you, they're about to apply some external discipline to your life in the form of, I just wasted your time and cost you a whole bunch of money. And then every time you drive away, what do you think? I'm going to sue this company for this radar detect. No, I'm just kidding. No, you literally think, man, I shouldn't speed. I shouldn't go that fast, right? Like, you can keep doing it, and they'll keep giving you tickets. And then they're going to take your driver's license away. And then you can drive without it, and then they'll pull you over for driving without a license, and they immediately take you to jail. I was in court one time, whole different story, but I was there. I wish I could say I was there with someone else, but I was there with me. And this girl came in and was in trouble for driving on a suspended license. And she's like, I can't go to jail because I have a kid and blah, blah, blah. And the judge is like, okay, okay. He's talking to her. And he goes, let me ask you a question. She goes, yeah. And he goes, how'd you get here today? She goes, what? And I was like, <laughs> he goes, um, bailiff, go ahead and take her to the county jail. Your sentence starts right now. How many people know you can figure it out? Or you can be made to figure it out. But what we have to do is start to accept external disciplines. When things happen in our life, let's learn from it. Look, if you've got to go through something, you might as well learn something, right? You don't want to go through something and come out just as stupid as you were before. That's kind of a waste, right? Or you can just smoke weed and get high and pretend it didn't happen. 
be a Democrat. <laughs> You're welcome. I shouldn't talk about politics. I'm talking about whatever I want. Some experiences in life will accelerate your maturing process. Guess what they're called? Trials. Without trials, you would be weak. You would be lazy, undisciplined, spoiled. Trials is what makes you who you are. A guy was telling me, no, maybe I read it on Facebook. I don't know. But, um, oh, I, I watched a video and this guy said this. He said, if you're going to blame your past and your pain on someone, you also have to thank them for what it made you. Yes. Is that good? Did you hear that? Yeah. Isn't that good? You, you literally, you, if you're going to say, my dad treated me bad and he did this and, and this and this and this, okay, but you also made it through it and it made you a better person and made you stronger. And so if you're going to complain, you also got to thank them for, guys, trials, look, they're not the most fun thing, right? But they can be the most positive thing if you'll understand the reason for the trial and what God's doing in you, right? Then it's a better, then, then I'm in a process. Check this out. This is a quote you need to get in your spirit. I'm not in a crisis. I'm in a process. Did you get that? We tend to look at it as a crisis. This is something that's happening to me instead of this is something God's allowing in my life to grow me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the three Hebrew youths, and um, Nebuchadnezzar told them that they had to worship him or worship his golden image of himself. And they said, when the music plays, you have to bow down, you have to worship. They said, we're not doing it. Everybody did. So he said, if you don't do it, we're going to throw you into a fiery furnace, and we're going to burn you up. And they said, we're still not doing it. And he likes these guys. They have the fiery furnace there. He's like, guys, I'm giving you one more chance. They're going to play the song. You need to like worship. I, I don't want to throw you in the fire. But I'm going to, because I said it, and I'm the king. That's what's going to happen. And one of the youth spoke up and said, we don't even have to think about what we're going to do. Because we're not bowing down to your idol. And our God can deliver us. And he says, and he will. And then he followed up with this last part that I bet he wished he never said. But even if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down. And we'll go into the fire. Nebuchadnezzar was like, all right, now I'm mad. Heat that thing up seven times hotter. How many people know fire is fire? It's like, make it hotter. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> like, we don't want to burn them. We want to burn them bad. Like, I'm going to kill you dead. I mean, I don't even know what that means. But <laughs> so they, they get it going so hot that it kills some of the guards that are taking them to throw them in the fire. Can you imagine as they were taking these three, they, it says they tied them up and they threw them down in the fire. So they threw them down. So can you imagine they're taking them there? The fire is so hot, it kills some of the guards on the way. If you were one of those three guys, how many of you have been like this in a trial? I'm almost there, Jesus. I know you're about to show up. Right? Here we go. Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but it's getting hot. And you ever notice that the Lord always shows up at the last second? Like that's what he does, right? They had to keep thinking, He's going to rescue us. He's going to rescue us. This is going to be a great testimony of how awesome he is. Ah, throws them in the fire. The Bible says threw them down. They fell down. Can you imagine how scared you would be? You just saw these guys just get burned up. They throw you in the fire. You fall down. You're like, ah, and then I'm not burning. And they looked at, can you imagine? They had to look at each other and be like, we're in the fire. We're not burning. Yes, high five, moonwalking, victory dance. That's what's up. And then the Bible says when Nebuchadnezzar looked in there, he said, did we not throw three men bound into the fire? And they said, yes, we did. He said, why do I see four men loose walking around and the fourth looks like the son of God? They wanted God to deliver them from the process, but the Lord delivered them through the process. If God would have delivered them before, it would have been awesome. But check this out. Sometimes Jesus is waiting for you in the trial so that you can see him in a way that you had never seen him before. You can get a revelation of him that you have never had before. You'll know him in a way that you had never known him if it wasn't for the trial. So the trial, the process, as scary, as hard as it was, was actually a blessing 
that, that matured them in their faith. And, and the awesome thing is that the, the King Nebuchadnezzar said, you guys, come out of there, please. <laughs> this is tripping me out right now, right? You know, the Bible says that they walked out. You got to get this, you guys. The Bible says they walked out and the fire had not touched them. The, the only thing that was burned in the fire were the bondages that men put on them. Some of us are being held back by the things that men have put on us. But the trial is going to deliver you from all of those things because the fire of the presence of God will release you from those things that are holding you back in your life. They went in. Everything that man put on them was broken off. They came out more free than when they went in. They had to be thankful that they, you got to get this. They had to be thankful that they went in the trial. They're not twisted people that are looking for a chance but they realize what it did in their life. Does that make sense? And then the Bible says this, this is key. It says, not a hair on their head was singed and their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. Now this is the part I want you to get to be able to apply to your life. If I'm gonna be mature in Christ, when I come out of the trial, I don't want anything of that trial to have left its mark on me. Yeah. They didn't smell like the trial. They came out more like God. But too many times I get mad. I try to take things under my own control. I don't trust the Lord. I get frustrated and I come out of the trial and I still smell like smoke. That's a sign that we're not as mature as we should be. We want to come out of the trial receiving that discipline that God is growing me through this. And when we come out of it, we don't want to smell like the trial. We want to be like God. Yeah. Amen. How many people are going through something right now? How many people want to come out not smelling like smoke? Come on, somebody. Leave that trial behind. You know what? You're more like God than you are the trial. Don't come out like the trial. Come out like the Lord. Samuel Rutherford said, Oh, what I owe to the furnace, fire, and hammer of my Lord. Those are the things that shape you, right? Those are the things that mold you. Hebrews 12, 10 says that God disciplines us for our good. Someone once said, there's something about maturity that comes through adversity. If you don't suffer a little, you'll never stop being a little kid. Paul said this, I have learned to be content with whatever the circumstances. Now remember, Paul was given 39 lashes a couple times. He was... Um, Stoned, not smoking weed, like Middle Eastern stoned. He was shipwrecked and spent a night in the ocean. Some people even believe that what he's talking about is he actually died and was raised from the dead when he was stoned. But guys, Paul had been through these crazy things. And what does he say? I've learned to be content no matter the situation. I've had much and I've had little, but I'm good. Because his happiness or his contentment is from the inside with his relationship with God, it's not determined by what's going on around him. But you can only say that when you've been through both. Is this helping anybody? Paul didn't reach that position overnight. It happened through difficult lessons in his life. I'm skipping stuff and I'm trying to find out what to skip. Let me give you this real quick because it's really good. Four attitudes that people have towards trials and sufferings, okay? Three of them are not good. Try to find out which ones you are. Number one, the fatalist. The fatalist. The fatalist is the person that regards whatever happens as inevitable and unalterable. So why fight against it? So they, they, these are the people that think like this. Why pray? Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. That means you're a fatalist. That means you don't believe that God can or will change anything if you pray. You also don't believe that anything that you do can change anything. So you just think whatever's going to happen is going to happen. It doesn't matter. And the Muslims believe that. They literally say this. It is the will of Allah. Well, you need to get a better God. Hey, I, I always see on um, YouTube like pictures of ISIS and stuff shooting at our troops. 
and then they find out how good of shots our snipers are. I don't know if you've seen those videos. It's pretty awesome how fast the soul leaves the body. It doesn't leave when it hits the ground. It's like, bam! Oh, they're talking to Jesus, and they're not happy right now. But it's weird because all those guys, I know some of you are shocked right now. You'll be all right. All those guys start screaming in the background. They're, they're so excited. They're so twisted and demonic. They have their phone. They're videoing these guys trying to kill people. And they're going, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, all into it like a bunch of freaking psychos, right? Allah Akbar. And then, pop. And their friend hits the ground and he's not there no more. And they start going, Allah Akbar. And they're saying the same thing, right? I translated that. You know what that means? Our God is in second place. It doesn't mean that? Oh, well, they keep losing to the Christian God, so I just thought it meant our God's in second place. Look, we lost again. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't mean that. I don't pretend to know languages. I just thought it made sense. It's like every time I hear them saying that, they're, they're, they're getting killed. Have you seen the one where they're all into it and stuff, and then a mortar comes in and just... It's the glory of the Lord, man. So that's what, that's, what they, that's what they believe. It's the will of Allah, whatever happens. Then there's the stoic. I, I tend to be like this. This is not a good thing. Their outlook is since you can do nothing about it, harden yourself, defy the circumstances, and let them do their worst. And some people think that's being tough. It's not being tough. It's not trusting God. It's saying, well, it doesn't matter. I can make it anyway. That's a wrong attitude towards trials because it that's what I was saying it doesn't produce the right character in you it doesn't produce maturity in you you come out of the trial after that smelling like the trial does that make sense part of the trial comes with you so you don't want to be like that then there's the epicurean and their attitude is this is most people today especially millennials let us eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die or let's just get high and stay up all night and we won't work and whatever we'll just do whatever we want it just doesn't matter life doesn't matter we'll just party and let, let me let me put it in today's language yolo you only live once man that's what that's a horrible attitude you will not mature with that attitude how many people know that's right why do people get drunk forget about their problems right why do people get high because they don't want to get a job so <laughs> they're just trying to forget how many people know when you're done your problem's still there that doesn't mature you. Let me give you a quick tip about life. Have you ever noticed that people who have spent years on drugs are very immature relationally and emotionally? That's because they checked out. They skipped all the process and they didn't grow up. Now they not only have to re-engage and live life without drugs, they have to try to make up for the years and grow up and become a functioning adult. Does that make sense? And then there's number four. This is our goal, the mature disciple. We don't just grimly accept the inevitable, but we accept the will of God. Check this out. And we embrace it joyously. So when we go through a trial, it's not that we're these twisted people that are like, yes, I'm going through this crazy trial, but we understand that God has either designed it or allowed it to grow me up. And even though through tears, I'll embrace it because apparently the Lord decided that I need it. Does that make sense? This is a lot. It's a lot, huh? It's a lot more teaching than we usually do, but time to grow up and get it all. Say grow up. Grow. Number three, we only got four. You're going to make it. Number four is real short. Number three is, like me, a little short. Develop right attitudes towards temptation. Develop right attitudes towards temptation. You know, I was driving, I used to drive on Saturday nights from Yuma and come here so I could preach in the morning. So I would leave after church and I would come and I would usually be, I don't know, midnight, one o'clock sometimes on the road, Dead Cow Road. How many people know where Dead Cow Road is? Yeah, it's just in the middle of nowhere. Right now, do not get out on Dead Cow Road. I don't care if you have to go to the bathroom, how bad, keep going. Get to the gas station because there are more rattlesnakes. My dad, used to, my dad used to hunt rattlesnakes. I know that's crazy. That's one of the places he went. They're everywhere. And so one night I was driving there, and I saw a four, about a four-foot diamondback going across the road. 
And I thought, oh, man, that's cool. I'm going to turn around and get a video of that for Pastor Carlo. I want to show it to him. So I pull over. How many people know, say this with me, don't play with snakes. So I pull over and I get out, mistake number two, get my phone, I get my video, and I start going towards the snake. He turns and heads right for me. He's probably, you know, maybe 20 yards away, but he literally, and at night, they're very active. And when it's summertime, they're cold-blooded. When it's summertime, it's hot. They are lively and they are aggressive. They are hunting and they're into it. He comes right at me and they're fast. So when I see him, the first thing I think is, I got to panic, right? Got to freak out. The second thing I think is cartoon running looks like activity. It just doesn't put distance between you and the snake, right? You ever see people run like that? They freak out, but they're not moving. Their legs are moving, but they're not going anywhere. So I didn't want to do that. So I, I, I remembered fast is smooth. Smooth is fast. Spazzing out is not going to get me there and I don't want to fall down. It'll bite you, just straight up. So I am, literally, all this went through my head really fast, and I was like, I have to slowly, calmly get in my car. So I'm trying to video him, he starts coming towards me, and I go, oh, and I turn around, and I walk like that fast, just straight from my car. I'm like, okay, watch where you're going, do not fall down, gotta get in the car. I get in the car, I'm recording the whole time. I'm gonna find the video, it's on my other phone, and I'll show it to you guys, you can make fun of me, you'll enjoy it. And then I'm in my car and I look, he goes under my car, he's going crazy. And I'm like out of breath because I'm terrified. And it looks like one of those Blair Witch Project videos because you can see like the roof of the car and everything. And then it goes by my face. You can see what I look like when I'm scared. My eyes are like that. And I'm breathing like, <laughs> like that, like all crazy, you know? And then I turned the phone off. And then when I got home, I watched the video and was cracking up, laughing at myself. I was like, that is awesome. Check this out, guys. Don't play with snakes. You know why? Because they're going to bite you. So what should I do about temptation? Yeah, don't play with snakes. It's going to bite you. And everybody thinks, well, it won't happen to me. Yes it, yes, it will happen. Now, God put Adam and Eve in the garden, and the garden was perfect. And he gave them one command. What was the command? Don't eat the fruit from this tree, right? That's it. But he forgot to mention that the most cunning, deceptive creature in the universe was loose in the garden in the form of a snake. He forgot to bring that up. Don't you think that would be something? He'd say, don't eat the fruit. Oh, don't talk to the snake. Don't you think that would have helped? Guys, don't talk to snakes. Don't get out of your car and play with snakes. Don't play with temptation. You will get bit. You might think you're okay. You're wrong. A lot of people have thought that. And I know everyone in this room has experienced exactly what I'm talking about. You play with it and you get bit. A mature disciple starts getting a mature attitude towards temptation and decides that it's probably not a good thing to play with. How many people are not going to pull over and play with snakes? How many people are just going to do it anyway because that's how you are? <laughs> so the word temptation in the Bible is applied to both the activity of God and the devil right? But the way that it's used, and in Greek and in Hebrew, both, both languages from the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word temptation, when it's used for, for the Lord, really would be better translated test. The devil tempts, God tests. Here's the difference. God tests for the purpose of proving you that you are authentic. Does that make sense? The devil tempts you for the purpose of ensnaring or failing you to prove that you're a fake. A lot of times they look like the same exact thing, but the Bible says that God cannot tempt man with evil. So God doesn't tempt you to fail you, but he tests you to prove you. Does that make sense? Got it? 
Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, was in Egypt. He rose up. Um, he, he was a slave. He got sold to a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar was rich. He had a hot wife. Um, and then everybody was gone, and Potiphar's wife got Joseph, who was also good looking. The Bible says he's very handsome. Pulled him aside and said, come on, let's do this thing. And Joseph was like, no way, I'm out of here. Joseph knew how to handle temptation. He didn't want to be there. He actually ran away. How many people know that's a good, good model? Of course, she stole his coat and accused him of rape, and he got thrown in prison for it. But, but he still did the right thing, right? He ran away. Um, he proved his character. So in that story, the devil tried to use the trick of no one will know. The problem with no one will know is maybe no one will know except you and the Lord. And it still has its effect on you and your relationship with God. A mature disciple realizes it's not worth it. It's not worth it. James says in James 1, 2 and verse 12, consider it pure joy, my brothers. How many people want to have pure joy? About what? Whenever you face trials of many kinds. Ah, oh, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Isn't that good? This process, the temptation, the things that you go through is going to make you a better man, a better woman for God. You're going to grow up in the Lord. Then also, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. Say, God is faithful. God is faithful. Listen to what it says. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you'll be able to endure it. The Lord will allow you to be tempted, but not beyond what you can handle, and then he'll give you a way out. Isn't that good? Yeah. So we need to believe that God is faithful, that he won't abandon you, that he's sovereign, that he's in control of the situation, that he's impartial. You can't say, I'm the only one, nobody else. No, not true. Maybe not the exact same trial or temptation, but the exact type of temptation for all people, right? And then believe that he's powerful and he'll make a way of escape. You know, have you ever said this? Man, it's one thing right after another. I just get through one trial and then the devil does the next thing. It's actually worse than that. The devil knows when to attack you. It's not one thing after another. It's two or three things at a time. And then when you get rid of one, he adds two more. And when you get rid of two, he adds five more. It's, that's how the devil works. The devil will kick you when you're down. I remember when I was about eight years old, there was a kid down the street. His name is Greg Korea. And he's 13. He was my friend's, my age, is his older brother. And this is hard to imagine, but I was eight years old, blonde hair, freckles, and the smartest mouth in our whole neighborhood. I know you can't even believe that, right? Because I'm so sanctified. And... Greg said something to me, and I said, shut up, Greg. And he picked up a brick from this yard, a loose brick, and he threw it at me. And I was standing in the street, and he threw it pretty far. And as it was coming, I was watching it, and it seemed like it was coming in slow motion. And I thought, when it hits the ground, I'm just going to jump over it, right? So it hit the ground, and I went to jump over it, but it bounced and hit me right in the shin. Now, imagine getting hit in the shin with a brick. It knocked me down. I was a little kid. So now I'm laying in the street. My shin felt like it got hit by a truck. But then I think, this is my chance. He'll feel sorry that he threw that brick at me so I can talk crap to him. So I'm on the ground. I'm like, see how you are, Greg? F you, man. Is that what you do? You throw a brick at a little kid. And I think I'm going to, like, shame him, right? He stops and turns around, and he says, say another word, Richie, and I'll come over there, and I'll stomp you in the street. How many people know I was done talking? Because Greg wasn't joking. Greg was throwing bricks, and when I was down and hurt, was going to stomp me in the ground. Guys, that's how the devil is. He will kick you when you're down. In your hardest times in your life, that's when he attacks you. And then we think, well, God's not watching out for me. Yes, he is. God is taking care of you all the time. He's there to help you. 
to deliver you from temptation. In your weakest moments, in your hardest times, that's when the devil is going to tempt you to try to take you out. But you have to, you have to decide that you're going to trust God. Elijah just killed 850 false prophets, and the next day he was spiritually, emotionally exhausted, and then the devil attacked him, and he was depressed, and he ran away from one woman. He's kind of smart. <laughs> Potiphar, when he was alone, I mean, Joseph, when he was alone with Potiphar's wife, same thing. Jonah, when Jonah ran from God, God said, I want you to do this. He said, no way, I'm out of here. He ran and just happened to find a ship waiting to leave right there. How many people in your life you've noticed that when you try to make your escape, the devil has it all laid out for you? Here you go. Whatever you want, I have it ready for you. Doors open to sin. Come on down. The devil will always provide that for you. And then Jesus, when was Jesus tempted? Jesus was tempted when he was in the, in the desert after 40 days of fasting. Then the devil came and tempted Jesus. That's when the devil attacks you. King David was tempted when he was neglecting his duties as a king. The Bible says it was the time when kings were at war. But David, instead of going to battle, was in pornography. What? Yeah, the Bible says he was on the rooftop and he was watching the women bathe because he knew what hour they would bathe. So he went up there to see naked women. He knew when to do it. How many people know that's just Old Testament pornography right there, right? It is, and then that's where the sin entered his life. Why? Because he should have been at war. Because you should have been at church. Because you should have been at life group. Because you should have been at home. Because you should go to bed when everybody else goes to bed, not stay up at night on the internet. Because you should be at your job. Because you should be with your kids. You should do what you're supposed to do. Because if you don't, the devil will be waiting to take you out. Are you here? How many people are frustrated that you've been living for God this long and you're still dealing with some of the same stupid stuff that you dealt with when you first got saved? Well, let's be a church that grows up. Let's be some people. It's not like we're saying, hey, man, you know, we don't want to be people that say, well, nobody's perfect and just keep living the way we live. Come on, let's grow up. No matter what level we're at, we can all grow. We can all mature. And it's time to do that, right? And then number four, this is the last one, really fast. Cultivate right habits. Say right habits. This, this point is literally two minutes, so we'll get this quick. In one sense, life consists of making habits and breaking habits. Making habits and breaking. How many people have ever broke a bad habit? Anybody in here broken a bad, bad habit? How many people in here have chewed your nails before in your life? You're one of those people that chew your nails. I remember when I was growing up, I was chewing my nails one day, and my dad, my dad, my dad was a Marine, and he was in Vietnam, and my dad was raised at the ghetto in Baltimore. My, my, Baltimore. my dad does not play. So if you're looking for a hug, he's not the guy. If you're looking for great life lessons, he's a great guy. So I was chewing my nails one day, and my dad, like, smacked my hand and my face. He wasn't really trying to smack my face, but he's like, stop doing that. And I was like, he said, let me tell you something, boy. You put your hands in your mouth like that. He said, you look insecure, and you look weak. You look like an undisciplined person sitting there with your hands in your mouth. And not only that, don't even touch your face. Keep your hands off your face. Sit up. Look at me when you talk to me. Open your mouth when you talk to me. And I remember that like shocked me. Well, it would, you know, it does when you're three. No, I'm just kidding. I was older than that, but <laughs> it does. It shocks you, you know, but I realized right there, I was like, hey, that's true. And you know what? Especially women, ladies, do not chew your nails. You know why? Because a beautiful thing about women are their hands. They're nice. We, we don't, men don't want your hands to be like our hands, right? And when it's all red and shoot up right here, we know what you do getting the skin, tearing it up, and then your hands on your face, you, you look insecure, you don't look confident, right? Don't do that. If, if you do it now and you feel bad, don't feel bad. Time to grow up. You cannot go to a job interview and get nervous in the job interview, and in one second, your hands in your mouth, you are not getting, I'm telling you right now, you are not getting the job. You're not going to. They're going to think, you know, 
Guys, we don't do that. Are you here? You might not. My dad has a great trick. What do they say? You need to put what on your fingers? Yeah, always, right? Hot sauce or rub them in, uh, in jalapenos, right? Get jalapenos on. My dad had a better one. He goes, you chew your nails again. I'll take you back in the backyard and I'll put your hand in dog crap. And I was like, how many people know you could wash that with bleach and 2,000 degree pressure washer? And you're still never going to put your hand in your mouth ever again just at the thought of that, right? I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I just stopped, right? So if you need to do that, take yourself over to your neighbor's house. Hey, man, I'm going to go out in your yard for a second. <laughs> Trying to grow up here, you know? So that's kind of a funny thing, but we do need to break some habits. One of them is being on time. Be on time. Just be on time. Because it shows that we respect people, we value them. If you're not on time, you're saying you're not important, right? And then we always don't say traffic and vote. No, you're just, you left late. You know why you left late? Because you either slept in or you dragged your butt around the house. Is that right? Are you here? Don't be late to work. Don't be late to meet people. Don't be late to church. Don't be late to life group. Obviously, if you're working late, that's fine. That's different. But come on. Be mature. Be a grown-up. Break those bad habits. Make the habit of your devotional time. Right? That's a great habit. Get in the habit of it. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. New has come. I'm going to give you this quote, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Here it is. We're done. Here's the last, last quote, then we're going to pray. God gives the soil, the seed, and the rain. Man supplies the skill, the toil, and the sweat. God gives us what we need, right, to be successful. Then we provide what God requires of us. And, guys, then we'll get the return on what we invest. Amen? All right. Come on. Let's be standing together. So you guys survived it. You guys did good. You guys okay? Man, we got we to gotta do more of this stuff. Being here for hours. Hey, it's how we grow, right? Another thing is you want to be a person that starts to have a, a developed uh, attention span for learning. Not just for church, but for your life, at your job. You're going to go to meetings that aren't as short as the videos that you watch on Instagram. So... Things are going to be required of you. Learn to focus. Learn what it takes to pay attention. That's going to help you mature and grow, right? Not just here. That will help you in school, help you at your job, help you with your family. It will help you in your, your spiritual life also. We want to do those things. We want to grow. Amen? How many people are ready to grow? All right. Come on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time this morning, and, and thank you for your word. Thank you that, that we're convicted by your spirit, that we're challenged by the example that you set, Lord. And Lord, I pray today that, that we would think about these things long enough that we could begin to affect some changes. That we wouldn't just walk out and forget what we heard. We would think about it this week. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, that we would be able to break some habits that have been holding us back in Jesus' name. Come on, receive that right now. We're not here just to learn some things. We're here for God to even help us change. And even right now, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. Some people have some, some hard habits that they're struggling with. Help us to break those habits. Help us also, Lord, to establish some good habits, especially devotional time. That just as one author said that we would wake up in the morning and we would smell the fresh air of heaven before we breathe in the smog of the earth. That we would wake up in the morning and determine that you're important that we would become disciplined. Help us to understand that trials are to make us better for you and for your glory, that you ultimately are, are working on us to form us and conform us to your image and your likeness. And Lord, we want to be like you. We're disappointed that we haven't grown as much as we could have. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for not being what we should be and who we should be by now. But Lord, by your grace, Forgive us and empower us so we could grow and we could go on from here. That we wouldn't be able to say that next year. That next year we would grow. We would look back and say, yeah, I really grew. I'm starting to mature in the Lord. And we would commit to a lifetime of growth in you. Lord, that we would be people that have something to offer in this life. And we would really be an example of your glory. And Lord, we, we love you. And we receive that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.